Hey guys, this is Danny. Thank you for tuning in today. We are excited for you to listen to this sermon that we entitled Weapons and War. We will be looking at a weapon that God has given us to use to fight this fight that we don't really think about a lot, a weapon called insight. And I want to show you today how important it is to understand and to see what you have on the inside of you. I pray that this message blesses you and it helps you through life. But I do want to emphatically remind us today that we are in a war. And while I was preparing this, I believe God was like, hey, I want you to talk about some weapons that I've given you or that you can obtain to fight this war. I said, okay, that sounds good. I'm going to go over to Ephesians and we're just going to talk about the armor of God. In my head, I thought, I got it. That's what God wants me to do. It makes sense, right? Let's fight a war. He's listed all kinds of weapons, the Bible, righteousness, truth. I had them all lined out. I was like, this is going to be easy. Thank you, God. And I began to study, and he was like, no, no, I don't want you to talk about those right now. I want you to dig a little deeper into the arsenal. Because God has given us an abundance of weapons that we sometimes leave on the sidelines and don't use. And so today, I want to talk to you about a weapon that maybe you didn't think was a weapon. I want to talk to you about insight. Everybody say insight. Insight. Y'all are like, that's not a weapon. The Bible's a weapon. Prayer's a weapon. No, insight is a weapon because I looked into the dictionary. I did that. I went and studied the dictionary during this for this one. It says that a weapon is anything you can obtain that will give you the advantage in a conflict with your enemy. And I'm convinced that we're going to read here in just a second, Paul talking to the church of Ephesus, that insight is an incredible advantage that we can have in our life against the enemy. I believe that. I'm convinced that a lot of us in our war wind up fighting the wrong thing because we don't have insight as into what we are truly fighting. We don't understand what we're fighting. And we can't see into what is going on. And so oftentimes we either fight the wrong thing or we just quit fighting. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. But before, while you're turning there, I have another passage that I want to go to because I want to set the backstory for you. Paul was a planter of churches, an apostle. That's what he did. All these letters you read... Corinthians, Thessalonians, Colossians, Corinthians, all, or Galatians, all of these are all letters that he wrote to churches that he started. And we're getting ready to look at a letter that he wrote to the church at Ephesus. But before we go there, I want to set the, story, the stage for you. He spent three, almost three and a half years building this church. His own sweat and blood, working so hard, getting the congregation, going out, witnessing the people, gathering the people, ministering to the people, discipling the people, teaching the people. He did all of this. And so right as he's getting ready to leave them, I want to read to you a little portion of scripture that he gave to the church of Ephesus as a warning. Acts chapter 20 verse 29 it says, and I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you. To God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paul says, look, I'm about to leave. I got another church I got to go start. I got other ministries I got to get going. But let me warn you, when I leave, wolves are going to come in. Things, people are going to try to come in and divide and separate and manipulate and harm you. But I want to tell you, be 
alert. Because the war doesn't stop when I leave. And I won't be here to fight with you physically. So I need you to understand that the war will get harder as you grow. The war will not get easier. It will get harder. But be alert. And I admonish you towards God and towards the gospel because that's what will build you up. And that's where in your inheritance lies. That's where your weapons lie. It's in the word of God. And so Paul's like, look, I'm leaving. Be alert because this fight's not over. This war is just getting started. Look, we're two years into this thing. We're just getting started. We fought some wars. Yeah. But we're just getting started. And the enemy doesn't like it. The enemy doesn't want it to happen. And it may look like sometimes peace has come and that maybe the enemy's taking a break and that maybe we can catch our breath. But the reality of it is you better be alert and you better be on watch because the enemy doesn't take breaks and he doesn't stop coming. So you better get your weapons. You better learn how to fight. Some of us have just stopped fighting because we don't have insight to see what's going on in our life. Man, we need to fight. So he tells the church of Ephesus that. And it brings us to our text in Ephesians chapter 1. Where we begin to look at what Paul wrote to this church. After he had left, he's writing back to them. And we start in verse 15. (laughs) And he says, for this reason. For this reason. What reason? Because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Man. The man who built the church is saying, hey, I'm hearing a lot of good things. I'm hearing of your faith. I'm hearing of your consistency. I'm hearing of your love. And man, for that, I thank God. And I'm always praying for you. I'm always praying for you. But listen to what he says next. This is where we get where we're going. I pray for you and I remember you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. This is Paul's prayer for his church. Next line, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. We want to stop right there. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. I, prefer, I, I grew up in a backwoods country church uh, where we read the King James Version. I don't know, a lot of y'all don't read that version because it has a lot of these and thous and thuses in it, and it's not easy to say. But I remember reading that scripture a little differently. In the King James Version, it says that I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be opened. That the eyes of your understanding would be opened. That you would begin to understand things better than you do. Because right now, you're not understanding what's happening. He says, look, I pray for you. And the first thing I pray, this is key, is that you would get more understanding about what's going on in your life. Kind of reminded me of Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. That said, yeah, get wisdom. But in all you're getting, get understanding. He's like, yeah, get all the wisdom. Get all the knowledge. I want you to get that. But hey, don't just get that. Get understanding because listen to me knowledge without understanding is dangerous wisdom without insight can be harmful to you and everyone around you because if you don't understand it you process it differently 
Situations in your life you may not understand, and because you don't understand it, you process it in a way that maybe years down the road you've been carrying pain and baggage, all because you didn't have the insight to understand why something happened to you. And Paul said, look, I'm just praying that you just begin to understand everything that's happening. Man, I've fought so many battles. Because how many knows a war is consistent, and it, and it, and it has just many little battles. That's what a war is. There are many little battles. And here's the reality of it. You're going to lose some of them. You will lose some of those battles along the way. But you aren't determined or defined by the battles you lose, but rather by the victory of the war that's already been won for you. Oh, but sometimes when we lose a battle, we think that that's just the end. Well, no, honey. No, sir. Pick your weapon back up because here comes another one. And you better be ready to fight the next one that comes. Don't lay your weapons down. Don't take your armor off just because you got beat in a battle. You will get beat in a battle. I've been beat in battles. That's just how life works. But here's the reality. Is that if we can get understanding into the battle as to what the battle means as to what the battle is for, because it's not what happens to you that matters, it's what you understand about what happens to you that matters. Oh, well, this is happening. Oh, that's why it's happening. Okay, that's, that's why it's happening. See, see, understanding and enlightenment is very key because Paul, again, writes to the, writes to the Romans in Romans chapter 10, verse 32. He says, do you not recall... Back before, after you were enlightened, that you endured struggles. Hang on, wait a second. This is what Paul's saying. That if you could see as to what and why the battle has come, then you will begin to understand, I can make it through this. That there is a purpose in the battle. That there is a meaning in the battle. That God has brought this to your doorstep for a reason. Because God already knows that you can overcome the battle you're fighting. But if you don't understand that, if you can't see into that, if you don't have insight as to, man, I'm fighting this because of this. Man, my kids are acting crazy and I'm fighting a war. But hey, I'm fighting a war because if I can beat this thing, if I can endure, there is a promise that if I would raise my kids up in the righteousness and in the admonition of the Lord, train them unto godliness, that when they're older, they won't depart from them. I have to fight this fight. I can't just throw my hands up and walk away and say, I just too hard. Man, the kid's stubborn. He's hard-headed. I'm so glad that my parents didn't give up on me because I was as stubborn and as hard-headed as you could get but you know what they knew they had insight into hey if we just keep fighting just a little bit longer maybe he'll get it and that's all parenting is it's just a hope and a maybe God please let something seek in <laughs> I just, I'm just going to keep throwing it at him and maybe maybe just maybe it'll stick but you have to have insight Insight creates foresight to see what's coming. And if you can see what's coming, you're better prepared to fight it and you can endure it. Man, I pray that we begin to understand. Not just know what we're fighting, but understand what we're fighting. Have insight into what God's purpose is through the fight. Because there's always a purpose. There is nothing that has hit your doorstep that hasn't first met the approval of him. And with that approval comes the understanding that this is for their good and not for their harm. That I'm doing this for a reason. And if they could just understand. If they could just look into the situation, not just at the situation then maybe, maybe, just maybe, they'll fight a little harder. They'll keep going just a little longer. They'll get those weapons together. They'll suit up for the fight because it's for their good, not their harm. And so as I begin to look into this just a little bit more and I begin to read 
on past this. I believe I saw that Paul was telling them there are three areas you need insight into. And he lists them right here. Listen to this. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened. Why? Why do you need insight? What's the insight into? That you may know what is the hope to which, you, which he has called you. And what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? Now I have kind of cliff noted this for you because I needed that too. I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I read the scripture and it doesn't really make sense and I have to keep reading and rereading and rereading. Um, I'm a slow learner and a slow reader. That's just how it is. But I begin to read slowly and I believe this is what this amounts to. If you'll walk with me and you have your pen, I want you to take down and we'll walk through it one by one. Have your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. The way I see that, the hope to which he has called you, what does God want from me? What has God called you to? What does God want from me? And I hear this question a lot. I just don't know what God wants from me. I don't, I don't, I don't have a clue what God wants from me. I look around and I see what everybody else is doing, but I've, what does he want from me? So this is a very key place to gain insight into that you would know what the purpose of your life would be. Because here's what we do all too often when it comes to God, is we do this whole uh, marital mistake, right? You're in a marriage, and what happens is a lot of times you work so hard to give the other person something that you want. Right? Husbands are shaking their heads. Wives are going, I'm not going to say anything. But that's true. It's, it's, it's the greatest mistake in a marriage that you just work so hard and so tirelessly to give them something that they don't want. In reality, you're trying to give them something you want. And you get frustrated. You get so frustrated because you're like, man, I've worked so hard to do this for you. And they're like, I didn't want it. I didn't want that. I didn't ask you for that. I don't know why you're doing that. I'd prefer it if you didn't do that, actually. It's annoying. Please quit. And the whole time, you're just like, man, I don't get it. I see other husbands, and that's what they do. I figured it would work. See, the reality of this is this, is that uh, you'll spend all your time trying to give God something other people are trying to give him. And he's like, I, didn't give, I don't want you to give me what they give me. I don't want you to give me that. Uh, they do this, so I'm going to do that. They give this, so I'm going to do that. And you know what I begin to think of? There's a story in the Bible back in the beginning of two men named Cain and Abel. You know, Abel, he worked in the fields, worked with livestock. Cain, he was relegated to the garden. I don't think he really liked that very much. Because back then, just as it is now, a lot of times we're masculine. You need me to move a car? I'll come move your car. You know, you need me to move your house? I'll come move your house. You need me to come mow your yard? I'll mow your yard. But don't ask me to do the dishes. Don't ask me to do that. That's not my job. I believe there was a little envy between Cain and Abel because Abel got to work out with the animals. And so it came time to give a sacrifice, to give to the Lord. Abel comes in, gives him his animal. Cain comes in, gives him fruit. And he got mad because God regarded Abel's gift. God regarded Abel's gift. And not Cain. And Cain got frustrated. Cain was angry. But God didn't disregard Cain's gift because it wasn't an animal. Please don't get it twisted. Like I think sometimes we read that passage and we think, well, that makes sense. God wanted animal sacrifices. And so that's why he regarded Abel's more than Cain. No, 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 no. Because God even said, if you read the scripture, God even said, hey, if you do well, will you not be accepted too? If you do good. And you have a good heart. Will you not be accepted too? You see, the problem wasn't the gift. The problem was that Cain wasn't satisfied with what he was given. He felt like he needed to give what what Abel was given. Man, I need to be given animals. 
Because that's what people, that's what men do. They kill animals and they give them to God. And here I am out in the garden and I'm going to give him a tomato. That doesn't make sense. I don't want to give what I can give. I want to give what they give. And a lot of times in the church, please hear me, a lot of times in the church, you'll feel inadequate with your giving because you're not giving what someone else is giving. And God's like, I didn't position you to give what they give. I positioned you to give what you have. So give what you have out of a heart of understanding that God's the one who gave it, so you give it to him. It's not a contest. I don't get up here and preach hoping that you leave going, man, I want to preach like that. I get up here and preach hoping that you leave going, hey, I got something that God has positioned me to give and I must give that. We don't don't feel like ours is good enough. We think we know what God wants. We think we know what God wants. And man, that is just like a man. Man, we think we know what people want. But God's like, look, I need you to have more insight. I need you to understand something more. I've positioned you. I've positioned you where I've positioned you so that you can give out of where you're positioned. Don't try to reposition yourself. Don't try to to transfer who you are and what God has called you to do. Don't try to do that. Just say, hey, God, I'm a gardener. And I love you. And this is the best fruit I have had in years and it's yours. God, I'm, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a singer. But hey, this is my, I'm a mom. Here's my kids. I give them to you. Hey, I, I can, I can, I don't know how to get on stage and lead and I can't talk in front of people. But God, I can stand in, my, in, in the aisle and stand in front of my chair and I can lift you high and I can worship you with everything I have. God, that's what I got here, here. And God says, hey, that's exactly where I positioned you. Thank you. And if you do good, will you not be accepted? Is not your gift good enough if you just do it good and do it out of a heart that says, God, it's yours? We need to understand what God wants from us. Or else we'll spend our entire life fighting to give him something he doesn't want from you. Number two. And man, this is, this is where, can you give me that water? Because here's the reality, don't, oh man. Whew. We did that a couple months ago and it ended badly. You couldn't have opened it for me? What, ser- what kind of servant are you? Because here's the, this point right here. Man, you may get a preacher coming out here in just a second. What does God want from me? Number two. <laughs> and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Number two, what does God have in you? What does God have in you? Oh, you need some insight into what is inside of you. Because here is where we so badly struggle in our life, right? Here is the part. Because if you don't understand what's in you, you will never walk towards what God wants from you because you won't be confident enough to do so. So you need insight, and this will give you the biggest advantage on the conflict that you have ever had when you begin to understand what God has in you. And here's the tricky thing. Here's what happens in life a lot of times. Everybody else in the room can see it, but you can't. Right, you you'll begin to have people tell you, man, mm, man, there's just something about you. Oh man, man, I don't know what it is, but I just like being next to you. There's just something about you, man. The way you pray, the way you just when you walk in a room, man, you just change the whole culture of the room because they see it, but you don't. You don't understand that what God has put in you is enough to sustain you to walk through what God wants from you because you just don't see it. You feel like, man, I need something else. I need something more. I, I, I don't have it in me to do anything. I don't have in me what it takes to do anything. And God's like, hang on just a second. Wait a minute. You just don't see what I've put in you. You don't understand what power, 
What riches I have laid on the inside of you. The Bible says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Listen, you are created vessel, and God don't create vessels to leave empty. He did not make you to leave you empty. He created you to house something. (laughs) He created you to hold something. He created you to take something inside, and it's going to sustain you. You see, we say it about a lot of people. Man, there's just something different about him. Something about he's just but they don't. They call it the it factor. But see, what we don't realize is that it is really a him, and he is the power and the spirit of Jesus Christ that he has placed within you. Greater is he that is is greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world it is already in you nothing can take away from or add to you don't need anything else listen listen look at David oh please look at David when he went to fight or when he went to take food to his brothers and there stood a a very tall great big man even taller than Dan and Matt like this dude was massive and he's standing there and all the all the army of Israel is just quaking in their boots and they've been yelling and and just being so mean and calling them names and just beating down the men and women of God they're all just in their tents hiding from this man here comes this little bitty dude Cameron Cameron (laughs) And he looks up on the hill and he sees this great big man just ridiculing the people of God. And he looks at that thing and he says, who's this guy? Who's this guy? And so he goes into the tent with the king. And he's like, hey, I'm going to take care of that problem. Yeah, I know. Literally, I'm five foot five. I look like a homeless guy because I, I do sheep. But still, I've never fought a war in my life. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you that I'm getting ready to take down that giant. I'm getting ready to rid the men and women of God of this guy. I'm going to do it. And they're like, okay, hang on. Look, may, I don't think so. But maybe if you want to, hey, I tell you what, go get the armor. I want you to go get something because we don't believe what's in you is enough to really do it. We need to add something to you to really make sure that we're going to give you the best shot you can to take down this guy. Go get the armor. You see, oftentimes we think we got to get more stuff. Look, I'll just be honest with you. I don't have a lick of schooling to my name. I mean, I graduated high school. I'm I'm not that, okay? I didn't drop out, okay? Like... You know, and I made decent grades. You know, decent. Um, but after that, I, got, I just got jobs. You want, you want, I mean, I could tell you about some jobs. I cleaned Porter Johns. I laid stone. Like, I've done every, Porter, I should not have said that. That was a bad job. But I don't have a lick of school into my name. And there's been many, 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 many times that walking through this call that God has on my life that I just feel like, man, okay, God, I know you called me. But it's not enough. I, I need to go back to school. I got to. Men and women, they, that's what they want. They want a dude who's went to school. They want this guy who has this, this education. And I've felt so inferior a lot of times. I really have. Like, man, that's just, I'm just, it's, uh, I, if I was David, I would have went and got the armor on. I would have said, oh, okay, that makes sense. Like, I'm going to go fight a dude who has a sword And he's got a lot of weapons. I need to put something on to protect myself because I'm just a shepherd. All I've done is hang out with sheep. I smell bad. I've never wielded a sword. I've never took the field of battle. Okay, you tell me I need an armor, I need an armor. They put the armor on him. And it just didn't fit. Weighed him down. Made him slow, couldn't move just right. I've done settled in my heart, guys. What God has in me, if it's not enough, if it ain't good enough. But see, I'm convinced, oh, I'm convinced that just like David felt that armor on him and said, no, I don't need that. Get that off of me. He understood 
that what God put on the inside of him on the back side of the mountain while he was tending to the sheep. That same thing that God put on the inside of him while he was just looking after animals was going to be the same thing that got him through the fight that he was about to fight. What is in you is enough. What is in you is enough. You don't need anything else. And he took that armor off and he took off after the giant. You understand me? Like he, I don't think, I really don't think David just kind of was like, ooh, here we go. All right, God, if you in this, uh, just, just do something. I'm just going to go. I'm going to walk. No. David said, hey, young, hey, big fella, you come at me <laughs> with a sword and a shield. But I come at you in the name of Jesus. Because that what is inside of me is well able to take care of what is in front of me. And I will not back down. I don't need nothing to add to me or take away from me. People can come. People can go. They don't add to what Jesus gave me. I don't build my dreams and my vision on other people. You better stop doing that right now. You don't build your dreams and your vision on what other people are. You build them on what God's put on the inside of you. Because what is in you is more than enough. Oh, God, would we not get such an advantage? Would we not have the upper hand on the battlefield like David did if we just knew what was in us? Oh, man. God, teach us. Teach us to know what you have placed on the inside of us. Thirdly, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? And my Danny Walker version is what will God do for us? What will God do for you? What is that power towards you? You see, what if? What if, Cameron, you can come, big guy. What if I do recognize what's on the inside of me? And what if I do trust it? And what if I do dare to step out and do what God wants from me? God, will you provide? Will you do for me? That's a, scary, it's a scary thing. It's a scary thing when you really recognize. Because David had to come to the understanding that I know what's in me. And I know what God wants from me. But will God do what I believe he can do? And I begin to think about these three little boys in Daniel. Some of you guys may know them as the Hebrew children. There came a time when the king had decided he was going to make this big golden image. And at the time that the music would start to play, everyone in the kingdom would bow. So the music played. Everyone bowed. Except three little boys. And word got around really fast and they said, King, look, everyone's doing what you ask them to do. But there's these three guys who they're getting ready to upset the whole apple cart and we need to take care of them. He said, all right, bring them here. They came before the king. And he said, is it true? Is it true? That when all this stuff went down and I done told you the decree went out, look, you need to bow. And, all, and then when the music played, you didn't bow? Yes, sir, that's true. He said, all right. All right, you're young. I'm going to give you another chance. We're going to do this whole thing again. I'm going to play the music. And I'm going to ask you and tell you again that when that music starts playing, you better hit your knees and bow to that, all, that image. The music played. They didn't do it again. And as I was reading that story, again, KJV guy, I grew up on it. And I like the way it says it. 
The king asked him again. He's like, man, what, what, why aren't you listening and obeying? Do you really think that you're... And listen to what they said. I love this. I love this part. Of, I think I've hung on to this scripture probably more than almost any other scripture in my life. Because I pray that one day I get this bold with the world. And they say, hey, king. Hey, king. And this dude had to, like, he, he, they knew that they, they probably getting ready to die. And at any moment, the king could snap his fingers and say, cut the heads off. We don't need them anymore. But this is what they said. They said, hey, king. We ain't careful in how we answer you. We're not gonna we're not gonna be careful of what we say. Because not only do we believe that our God is able, <laughs> we know He will. We know what He will do. We are confident in what He will do. We're gonna step out, trust that what is in us is good enough. Believe in what God wants from us is to stand when everyone else bows. And due to that, oh, we're confident that God will do what he says he will do. And the king said, okay, we're going to put that to the test, young men. Bind them and throw them in the fire. Bang, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Before you do that, I want you to heat that thing up seven times harder. Because I think the king was just a little ticked off that these young boys told him, I am not going to watch what I say around you. You may be king, but you don't know the king. You may be the one who oversees this, but you don't know the one who oversees it all. You may be the one in charge of these guys, but you don't know the one that's inside of me. I will not be careful what I say. I will not stop saying this. My God is able and my God will. So you better heat that thing up and hope to God something happens because I'm confident God's bringing me out of this fire. Here's what you don't know is that you will never know what God will do for you until you're in the fire. Some of y'all want to know what God will do, but you don't want to go in the fire. You don't want to stand and say, I am not careful as to what I believe. I will not stop teaching regardless of how you think about me, regardless of how I think about myself, regardless of how worthy you may think I am, regardless of how worthy I may think I am. I'm going to keep preaching. I'm going to keep teaching. I'm going to keep walking because I'm confident that what is in me is enough and that what God wants from me, if I step out and do it, God will do it again. He's already stepped up and done everything for you. He done paid the cost for your life. You know what? And if God, if God looked at you and said, hey, you're worth my son. I'll pay, I'll do, you want to know what I'll do for you? I'll send my son for you. If God's willing to say that, then you better bet everything in your life that if you look inside and see what you have on the inside, and if you step out to do what God's called you to do, man, He will pay everything for you. His power is immeasurable. Isn't that the word that they use? Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't make that word up, right? Like, that's His immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe. You can't even measure it. So today, today I ask you, do you have insight? Has the eyes of your understanding been opened to the point to where now you can say, hey, I know what God wants from me. And I know what God has in me. And I know what God will do for me. Man, you take the battlefield with that? Oh, come on now. You walk out there to fight your enemy with that kind of insight? You walk out there to fight this enemy with that kind of insight, man, I promise you, no battlefield will be too big for you. No giant will be too big for you. No weapon formed against you will prosper. That's what God will do for you. Would you stand? As we do this song, I want you to remember... That what has happened to you does not matter. Rather, what you understand about what has happened. So maybe you don't understand what happened. I'm going to ask you, be faithful this morning to ask God 
to do what Paul prayed for this church. God, hey, look, listen. I need you to open the eyes of my understanding. I've been living life, and I've been basing my warfare on just what I see. God, I need to be able to see into that. I need some insight as to what is really going on. God, would you show me what you want from me? And God, would you help me to see that what is in me is enough? And help me trust and believe that you will do what you say you will do. God, I need you to do that this morning as we sing. Thanks again for listening to this sermon. And if you'd like to keep up with us, you could do so by going to our Facebook page or our Instagram, or feel free to go to our website at gracemeadows.cc, or we would love for you to come and worship with us at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings.